Hello once again, I'm Staff Sergeant Tracy Keller and thanks for joining us for Air Force TV's live coverage of Air Force Association Air and Space Conference. If you're just joining us, the Air Force Association's Air and Space Conference and Technology Exposition brings together Air Force leadership, industry experts, and current aerospace professionals from around the world to discuss the issues and challenges facing America and the aerospace community today. We just heard from General Hawk Carlisle and his perspective on fifth generation warfare and the way ahead. And later today, we'll hear from Chief of Staff of the Air Force, General Mark Welsh III, with his, up, uh, with his Air Force update. But for now, let's head over to National Harbor, where our own Tech Sergeant Holly Roberts Davis is standing by for Air Force Materiel Command General Ellen Polakowski's discussion on harnessing the coming aerospace revolution. Tech Sergeant Holly Roberts Davis, what can you tell us about this upcoming session and what we can expect? All right, thank you so much, Sergeant Keller. Um, you know, so far things are going pretty smoothly here at the National Harbor. Um, it's day two of the conference, and we're really off to a great start so far. Um, everybody's gotten their breakfast and probably headed to lunch now and um, making their way around um, getting all the conference and uh, everything the exposition has to offer. Um, as a reminder, if you missed any of the panels or discussions from day one, don't worry, we'll have those posted to Bluetooth shortly after the conference ends. You can find Secretary of the Air Force Deborah Lee James's speech on the aerospace revolution, as well as the town hall featuring the Chief of Staff of the Air Force General Mark Welsh III, Secretary James, Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force James Cody, and their spouses. Um, that was the Airmen and Families Town Hall and covered a lot of programs that we can expect for the next fiscal year. So if you missed any of that from yesterday, just head over to Bluetube at youtube.com forward slash AF Bluetube and look for those sessions. Um, but right now we are waiting for the Commander of Air Force Material Materiel Command, General Ellen Polakowski, as you mentioned, her discussion on harnessing the upcoming aerospace revolution. General Polakowski Polakowski, excuse me, assumed command of Air Force Materiel Command at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in June of this year and has been busy ever since, leading some 80,000 people and managing $60 billion annually. Air Force Materiel Command conducts research, development, test and evaluation, and provides acquisition management services and logistics support necessary to keep Air Force weapon systems ready for war. The Air Force Research Lab falls under AFMC, which is the only organization wholly dedicated to leading the discovery, development, and integration of warfighting technologies for air, space, and cyberspace forces. Air Force TV actually recently sent a team to Wright-Patterson to cover just one aspect of the Air Force Research Lab, Brain Stimulator. Um, if you'd like to see more about the Air Force Research Lab and Air Force TV's coverage of Brain Stimulator, check out our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash Air Force TV. That's going to be a blue episode um, titled Brain Stimulator. And of course, we'll be back again at 110 Eastern Time for the Chief of Staff's much anticipated Air Force update. And if you stick around after that at 3.35 p.m., we'll be here to sit in on another panel about meeting global requirements in a time of austerity with General Frank Gorenz, General Lori Robinson, and the Deputy Undersecretary of the Air Force, Heidi Grant. And as always, you can join in on the conversation today by using the hashtag ASC15 in any of your Facebook posts or tweets. Some of you may have questions for Secretary James or Chief Cody, so you can reach them on their respective Facebook pages. But of course, still use that hashtag ASC15 to make sure your questions get seen. Um, right now, it looks like things are actually about to get started in the ballroom, so I'm going to go ahead and be quiet. I'll turn it over now to AFA Executive Vice President Mark Barrett for his introduction General of General Polakowski. Thanks. AFA's Executive Vice President Mark Barrett. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of the Air Force Association, welcome to the 2015 Air and Space Conference. Our next speaker serves as Commander, Air Force Materiel Command, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, Ohio. The command employs approximately 80,000 people and manages $60 billion annually, executing the critical mission of warfighting support through leading-edge science and technology, cradle-to-grave life-cycle weapon system management, world-class developmental test and evaluation, and world-class depot maintenance and supply. She'll make a presentation, if time allows, we'll open up the session for questions. I remind you the cards that are sitting on your chair where you can fill out and pass to the corners and we'll get those in front of her. Each of you should have a copy of her bio 
We're very pleased to have her speak with us again this year. Please welcome to the stage General Ellen Polankowski. Well, good morning, everyone. Okay, so everybody's all spread out. You can come forward if you want, because none of the big guys are going to come because the four, three former secretaries are speaking in another room. But I've locked the door so you can't escape now. Too late. You made your decision. Um, first of all, thank you for coming today. This is pretty special for me. This is, um, I've been coming to this conference for many, many years, and this is the first time I've had an opportunity to, to speak on the big stage um, at this. And this is really my first um, formal presentation of any, uh, of any significance since I took over as the uh, commander of Air Force Materiel Command in, uh, in June. So it's my first opportunity to kind of brag on the great things that Air Force Materiel Command is doing and to be able to share where we're going. Now the topic that was given to me was harnessing the coming aerospace revolution. And this in the focus, I think, in the context of all the things that we see going on, particularly in the industry and around the world, about how we in the Air Force are going to leverage these things. But, you know, as I was looking at this, I decided it, I'm not, my, uh, if you know me, I'm not much of a harnesser of things. I'd rather be a revolutionary. So what I'm going to talk to you, what I'd like to do over the next few minutes is to share with you some of my fellow revolutionaries and what we're doing within Air Force Materiel Command uh, to leverage um, those things that are going on and to create those revolutions in the aerospace world uh, to make a more, continue to make the world's greatest Air Force effective as we go into the next, the next decade and, and the decades after that. And it's a pretty important time to, to, to think about that future. If you look at today, it's a very different environment in the world that the Air Force has to deal with, arguably even than what it was five years ago. Um, by that I mean, you know, five years ago we were focused on uh, the global war on terrorism and the major focus was uh, on Afghanistan and Iraq and, and that, uh, that, that type of environment. We built up our MQ-9s. Uh, we had uh, all of our focus in that area. And then this gentleman over on the bottom, bottom left hand, uh, right hand corner for you uh, pulled a little surprise on us and walked into the Ukraine. And there was a little bit of student body left as we looked at how do we deal with, with that environment. And then on top of that, um, General Hyten in the space community learned a lot about what the Chinese were up to in those two areas on the top when we talk about cyber attacks and, uh, and what's going on in the space environment. And then, of course, our constant reminder of, uh, of uh, the importance of the Asia-Pacific, particularly when we look at um, our friend in, in Korea. Well, for the Air Force, We've been there for each one of these. You know, you've heard about our deployment of the F-22, and of course, the great Airman General Breedlove, the first thing he turned to was his F-15s when we dealt with the Ukraine, and now we've deployed the F-22 there. We've got our great cyber warriors uh, down in San Antonio that you may have seen a lot about. They're, they're there. Uh, uh, General Hyten and his campaign clan, plan when it comes to the, the space world. And of course, our MQ-9s, the rest of the services have left. We've never left the, the, uh, the, the AOR when the MQ-9s continuing to fly there. And then of course, our show of force with our, B, our bombers and with respect to our North Koreans. All of these are areas that the Air Force is involved in all five of our mission areas, essentially 24 hours a day in a, in, in a, in for a long-term basis. But one of the things that was highlighted over what I just described is the importance of our ability to shift and to be agile, to use the word that the Secretary used yesterday when she talked about operational agility. Our ability to one minute be focused on ISIL um, in, and then the next minute at, at uh, response to um, 
President Putin's comment that he's deploying 40 additional ICBMs. Uh, this is not the environment that many of us grew up with where there were set pieces and, you know, you put together campaign plans and you had months to prepare and build up like we did for Desert Storm. This is a pull on our, our Air Force and our capabilities to be able to move rapidly and effectively and to be able to adapt. And that is what the Secretary talks about when she talks about strategic agility. And indeed, as she mentioned yesterday, about a year ago, we put out a new Air Force strategy. And General Welch summed up what I was just describing when he said that, you know, they're the same five missions that we've been doing since we were just uh, young pups right after World War II. But we have to think about how we're going to do them differently. And then the Secretary highlighted, you know, the key element of this strategy is all about a strategic ability. We need to be quicker. We need to be able to uh, go around the world. We need to be able to respond and change rapidly. Well, all of those things I talked about in that previous chart, and if you look at this, what I will put it to you is that the Air Force cannot be, none of those things happen without Air Force Materiel Command. Whether it's the discovery of new ideas um, in their development by the Air Force Research Lab, or the full life cycle management of those weapon systems. When the F-22 deploys, you better believe General Fick knows what's going on and he's engaged from the life cycle management center. The, the, the test center in terms of their, uh, their conscience for us to make sure that what we're developing and what we're fielding actually works the way we advertised it, because sometimes we're a little optimistic in terms of what we do. And then, of course, the Air Force Sustainment Center that is the heart and soul of keeping all of our systems up and flying. So whether it's F-22s flying to Europe, or it's MQ-9s uh, flying o over ISIL, or frankly, if it's even space systems uh, that are operating out of installations, Air Force Materiel Command has got to be there doing our job. And I put it to you that if we aren't agile, then the Air Force can't be agile. If we can't turn quickly and we can't be responsive and we can't be quick in terms of, of our processes, then the Air Force is not going to be agile, either operationally agile, as the Secretary talked about, when it comes to day-to-day -day operations, or strategically agile when it comes to looking at our future. So right, right after I took command, we had a, a relook at the AF Air Force Materiel Command mission statement, and we revised it somewhat to highlight the importance of agility when it comes to the material management, which is what Air Force Materiel Command does, and truly our entire focus on agile combat support. Uh, because we go everywhere now from the Air Force Research Lab with develop, developing and discovering new ideas to the Air Force Installation and Mission Support Center led by Major General T.C. Carter, which is responsible for the installations across the world for, air, for our airmen and the mission support associated with those. So our job is to deliver and support agile war and winning capabilities in all three domains, air, space, and cyber. We do it um, because our vision is delivering the world's greatest air force. The Air Force's vision is that the world's greatest air force. For us, we've got to deliver that world's greatest air force. And we want to do it by being the most trusted and agile provider of innovative and cost-effective war-winning capabilities. General Welsh told me that he considers AFMC the cost conscience of the Air Force. Combine that with our, build, our need to be, um, be agile and innovative, that's what it's all about. And so when we look at harnessing the coming aerospace revolution, I tell you that we're looking at how do we be more agile? How do we become more agile in two ways? First, if you look at the mission statement, the word agile is in there. That, what that means is that the weapon systems that we discover at AFRL and we develop through LCMC and we test at the test center and we sustain have to be agile in how they operate. That means we need weapon systems that are easily adaptable. We need the value of numbers, not just quality when it comes to our weapon systems, which means that we need to have cost-effective weapon systems, lower cost solutions that allow us to be able to distribute in a wider span of the globe and, and, uh, and to be able to adapt those systems quickly. So our focus 
is on as we look at the early stages, as we're looking 15, 10 to 15 to 20 years out, how do we ensure that those systems that we're fielding, Joint Stars Recap, for example, uh, LRSB, all of those have to have adaptability and speed in terms of how we're able to use those in, as agile war-winning capabilities. On the other token is the word agile in our vision statement, which talks about us being an agile provider. That means that everywhere from the research lab has to be able to quickly deliver capabilities um, or sustain those capabilities or support those capabilities in an agile way, meaning that we have to be able to be flexible, we have to have speed, and most effectively, we can't break the bank. We have to be cost effective so that the Air Force can afford to use the weapon systems that we have today. So when we look at our, our mission and our vision, our focus when it comes to agility and our focus in, if you will, creating that aerospace revolution is how do we deliver more agile weapon systems and how are we more agile in terms of how we provide the material management for those weapon systems. And so what I want to do with the rest of my time here is share a couple of my fellow, the stories of a couple of my fellow revolutionaries, if you will, within Air Force Material Command. The first of which is Lieutenant John Kagagas. Lieutenant John Kagagas is from uh, Illinois, and he is really in the spirit of Jimmy Doolittle because he is an engineer by training, but he's also a pilot. He's a small UAS pilot, unmanned aerial system pilot. And what John has been focusing on is getting at that adaptability and low cost that I talked about for our agile weapon systems. And it's a cartoon there of the swarm of small UASs. It may look like a cartoon today, but it is, we believe, can be a very much a game-changing reality for our Air Force in the future. We have some pretty awesome munitions today, but they're very expensive. And they rely, and they, the sep when we separate the, the weapon from the aircraft, we separate it from the human. The whole focus here is to take these small, unmanned aerial vehicles and, and dealing with the sophistication that autonomy can provide us, but also keeping the man in the loop for a longer period, are able to essentially replace some of those more costly munitions with smaller munitions that actually um, are delivered by talking to each other under the control of a human. This is a, what's called collaborative and distributed operations. So imagine, and maybe if some of you have seen the Audi commercial with the, the little robots coming down. Well, Lieutenant John Kagadagas is working on that today, but with a real mission capability. And the whole purpose, one of the focuses of his area is right now we're up to being able to command and control. We're going to test this month five with just one person. So you've heard General uh, Welsh in the Air Force talk about our crisis when it comes to pilots for unmanned aerial vehicles. Well, this is a part of our activity. If we're going to be able to do multiple um, swarming UASs, then we have to be able to have, we can't have swarms of airmen because it won't be cost effective, will it? It won't be, we won't be able to do it. So the whole purpose of his activity is to demonstrate that the technology is there to enable us to develop these swarming weapons, if you will, that will enable us to be agile and cost effective as we go forward in the future when we talk about delivering of uh, munitions and putting effects on the battlefield. So there's an example of what my revolutionaries are doing in terms of bringing that agile war winning capability to the Air Force. But we all know in here that it's not always going to be just new systems, that our systems that we have today are going to be with us for a long time. And if we're going to have agile war wing capabilities, we also have to figure out how do we make the systems that we have today uh, more agile and adaptable as we go to the future. And one of the things that we're working on is something called open mission systems. And I want to introduce you to my second revolutionary, which is Lieutenant Colonel Ryan Knapp. Ryan is part of the B-2 program office. He hails from uh, Minnesota. And that is a B-2, purposely blurry, 
in terms of the details on there, but I think the message you see is that's a pretty complicated weapon system. And it was not built in a time where we were focusing necessarily on adaptability, um, but it is an awesome weapon system. And it's going to be in our portfolio for a long time. And the idea behind applying open mission systems to systems like the B-2, like the F-16, like the F-15, is our ability to bring capability quickly into these systems by establishing an open mission systems approach, particularly with avionics and then other systems with on it, we are able to do, if you will, a plug and play approach to a new box. We develop a new radar for one system. We can be able to, by applying open mission systems, we can take that same radar and put it on a different platform like the B2 and we can quickly bring new capability onto our, our legacy platforms and therefore be adaptable and responsive and lower cost because I'm not developing seven different boxes for seven different aircraft, if you think about it that way. And I don't have proprietary because I can pull a box off and put another box off from, from another vendor. What, what Ryan did, working closely with Northrop Grumman, is in just eight weeks, they implemented an open mission system architecture on the B-2 and actually flew a mission in which they communicated with a Gulf Stream with an off-the-shelf radio. Now, if anybody knows anything about the B-2, whenever you tried to do anything with the B-2, we used to affectionately say the B in it stood for billion, that it would cost a billion dollars, and that it would take at least a couple of years. Well, what they did in eight weeks would have taken us months to do, and they demonst but most importantly, from my perspective, they demonstrated that you could, if you will, teach an old dog new tricks because we took a system that was developed without open mission systems and we applied the open mission systems architecture. And think about the potential of this in the future, providing that agile warfighting capability when we can bring new capability very quickly onto our existing legacy systems. It's part of an overall effort that has been led by the Rapid Capability Office to be able to introduce open mission systems across the Air Force. And you'll see it in acquisitions like Joint Stars Recap which is going to start from the beginning with open mission systems as LRSB is today. So these are two examples of how we are applying warfighting or getting to those more agile warfighting capabilities. But let me shift to talk about what we're doing to make sure that AFMC and our material management is more agile because I got some more revolutionaries to introduce you to. The next one is Mr. Chris Eigenier who works for the Seek Eagle office. Now, I don't know how many of you know what the Seek Eagle office is, but when we develop a weapon and we want to put it on an aircraft, we take it down to Eglin and we do some first some analysis and then we fly flight tests to verify that that weapon and that aircraft can fly together and we can do the release safely. Flight test is expensive. And, the, and, and one of the things that we have tried to do over the years is to develop a digital way to analyze um, our weapon systems. Collecting the intellectual property rights from our industry partners can be an expensive proposition to build these digital threads. So what Chris has done is using a laser um, uh, scanner, is he's, we have actually la used the laser scanner to build 3D models of our aircraft as well as the bays. For example, recently in the F-35, and I see uh, General Richardson here, we're gonna do the scan of the KC-46 real soon. And what that allows us to do is to dramatically reduce the time it takes to integrate weapons onto aircraft and the cost associated with it. So again, this enables Air Force Materiel Command and the great folks in our test center to more rapidly field things at a much lower cost and in, in a more adaptable way. By building these 3D models, we can actually do, share those with the designers and enable us to, right from the beginning, make sure that we're minimizing any scrap and rework. I mean, we're all in favor of testing, but this way we can focus that test, minimize that test. And just to give you an example, instead of months to develop the models, the configuration models. It's taking us weeks. In the case of weapons, we're going from weeks to days. And in our business, time is money. And it's agility and ability. So Chris is um, working on that. While Chris is doing that, over in the Air Force Sustainment Center, and you know, people talk about sustainment. You're not doing any, 
you know, where is that innovative or creative in sustainment? Well, let me tell you, our Air Force Sustainment Center is leading the way in looking at creative and innovative ways. And this is Mr. Ryan Perry. And Mr. Ryan Perry has re responsibility for getting the parts, if you will, for some of our legacy systems, like the B-52. Now, the B-52 has been flying for as long as I've been alive. And there's parts on that thing that are not available anymore. And in particular, one of them is there's a blower on it, a little piece, right? But can drive a lot, can, can ground the airplane if it's not working. It has a hundred different parts in this little piece because it was designed a couple decades ago. Well, what Ryan did is he applied 3D printing, additive manufacturing, and reduced that hundred parts to one part. So we are now developing these impellers for this blower using additive manufacturing, 3D printing, and we can now deliver a part in three days. And, and having to reverse engineer and hire somebody to build to a print. Think about what that does in terms of our agility, our ability to quickly turn a B-52 when it comes into the depot, about the cost associated with the supply line. Now think to the future about what this could do is that I wouldn't even buy any parts. I could actually just have the digital design for those parts and when I need a part, we, we turn on the additive manufacturing. So Ryan is another one of my revolutionaries and he hails from Mesa, Arizona, living in Oklahoma City right now. And then after Ryan, we have um, Lieutenant Holly Holcomb, H Haley Holcomb. Now this is another example of how you really can teach a real old dog new tricks. Haley is the chief engineer, test engineer for what we call the nuclear red team. Now, the red teams are not a new thing. We've been doing red teams in the Air Force largely through the Rapid Capability Office for years, but we've never applied them to our nuclear enterprise. And what the red team does is uses modeling and analysis and, and, and testing to look at how our weapon systems will respond to new threats as we go forward. Now, you can see how important this is because it enables us for things like ground-based strategic deterrent, our next ICBM, to be able to actually analyze and understand what are the key requirements for that in terms of the threat. But it also helps Global Strike Command when they're trying to figure out how to deal with today's threats. So by using the red team, and, what, and, and, and Haley is standing next to an Alcom, and what we have done is we've been able to expose the Alcom, and I can't go into the details, to some of the threats that it would face in the next couple of years, and been able to work with Global Strike Command to actually do uh, changes to their conducts and their TTPs. Think of the power this has for us as we bring that, what, that nuclear enterprise forward and an ability for us to work very quickly and effectively with Global Strike Command to ensure that the requirements are right and that we take into full account all things, including con ops, to new development as we go forward with these. Again, not a new technique, but a technique that we have never used in the nuclear enterprise, and it is already showing huge benefits in our ability to adapt that enterprise and to be agile in terms of our understanding of what the requirements are. And then certainly, last but not least, is the Air Force Installation and Mission Support Center where we're applying what I affectionately call uh, something very valued in the space business called situational awareness to something which most people think is pretty mundane and that's management of civil engineering projects and capability. Uh, General um, Robinson, who's one of my most important customers, uh, for her, building partnerships is a very important part of her PACAF mission. And the Air Force Mission Support and Installa Installation and Mission Support Center is a critical part of that because we have the Air Force Center for Engineer Civil Engineering Center. So that, that gentleman right there is Senior Master Sergeant Vernon Jackson. He hails from my, air, my part of the country. He's from Newark, New Jersey. And he's responsible for managing over $300 million of O&M across three different na uh, NAFs in seven different wings, includes 80-some engineers. In, in what, what General Robinson requires is daily situational awareness on what's going on with these civil engineering projects. This is not just throw it over the fence and when the CEs are done, they'll let you know. Because of the integral part of this to her building partnerships, it is a daily requirement. So what, what Vernon has done is he's applied 
some of the great information technology tools we had. He's built a collaborative environment. He's used chat rooms to connect all 80 of those um, engineers around the Pacific. The tyranny of distance is not a problem for, for Senior Master Sergeant Jackson. And as a result of this, they've been able to dramatically reduce the amount of time they're spending preparing status briefings. And they have near real time status on these capabilities and know where those systems are and they can more effectively manage those dollars. They can leverage their expertise regardless of where that distance is in a very effective way of being more adaptable, more being more agile and more cost effective as we deliver what people might think is a, you know, a mundane thing that doesn't require a whole lot of uh, uh, opportunities to innovate. So even in those things that are traditionally we haven't focused on applying new technology and new capabilities, that's a major focus for us because for Air Force Materiel Command, it is all about being agile in terms of delivering the capability, whether it's the new technologies or it's the fundamental thing about making sure that General Robinson knows where, what the status is of those civil engineering projects. So this was a quick scan of, the, of what's going on in terms of harnessing, or I argue creating, that aerospace revolution uh, by Air Force Materiel Command. Because for us, this is what it's all about, delivering the world's greatest Air Force. And we need to make sure we're doing that today and that we can do it in the future. Strategic agility is going to be critically important, as you heard from the Secretary yesterday. And the Air Force cannot be strategically agile if Air Force Materiel Command isn't agile every day. And that's our focus. Those of you in the, that um, are part of Air Force Materiel Command are getting tired of hearing me use the word agile. But, they're, they're, but I can tell you I've been across many parts of the command, and we get it. We understand the importance it is for us to be there and to be, a, a, because we are essentially that backstop for the Air Force. And uh, we're proud of it, and we are proud to be the leaders of this revolution. And with that, I'll pause, and if we have time for some questions. Yes, ma'am, thank you so very much uh, for your pr presentation. We do have a couple questions for you. Uh, the Secretary has talked about the impact uh, to the Air Force if there's a long-term uh, continuing resolution or a budget that's passed that exceeds the Budget Control Act and therefore sequestration kicks in. So could you talk about what that might impact to either maintenance or some of the other things that you're involved with? And is that word getting out? Um, okay, the first question is, particularly in a year-long continuing resolution is very, very challenging for us. And it is in the context uh, a lot of people don't realize this, but even under sequestration, the funding level is higher than our FY15 budget. And so if we're in a continuing resolution, continuing resolution basically set, typically says you're going to be funded at the level you were funded last year, so keep on doing the things that you were doing. Just to give you an example of from my level how problematic that is, let's just take the Air Force Sustainment Center which operates on working capital fund, which means that we are looking, we have to plan ahead so that we have the right workforce, we have the right supplies, we have the right parts for our job for the, for the year ahead. We, if we now get less funding than we th anticipated from the life cycle management program managers because they don't have the budget to bring planes in for their depot maintenance, um, and do those uh, and, and all those things that we need to sustain it, I got a problem. First, I have to balance that workforce. Um, secondly, it's going to back up those, those weapon systems. They're not going to get through the depot when they were supposed to, and that's just going to make 17 that much harder because now I'm going to be impacting readiness because I have too many planes that aren't ready to fly because they haven't had their regular maintenance that we know is critically important. For the Life Cycle Management Center, you heard the Secretary say there's 50-some new starts. We have been gearing up to be able to hit the ground running on these and trying to put the request for proposal together and all of those things that enable us to start a program, we will have to stand that activity down. It will delay things. 
and we will have to slip critical EC engineering changes to different weapon systems. We will, and any time in the life cycle management business that you slow things down, it's never cheaper. It's never cheaper. I've never seen anything that was, was, that was cheaper when it took longer. So it's going to slow down the life cycle management. The test center, we are not going to be able to um, get um, gear up for the test. We will not have the resources to conduct the test to support all of the weapon systems. We're going to have to make the hard choices. And then, remember, I've got Air Force um, Installation and Mission Support Center as well, and there are a number of key um, uh, civil engineering projects associated with the F-35 and the KC-46 that will not be able to start. And with that means they will impact our ability to meet those key targets. We, you know, we talk a lot about our industry partners when we talk about the F-35 and we talk about the KC-46, but there's a piece to the Air Force that has to deliver the capabilities that we have, in particular the uh, the uh, military construction projects, and if they don't happen, we're going to be behind the power curve, regardless of Duke is successful in getting those airplanes, and Duke and Boeing are successful in getting those airplanes. So now, as far as how well it's being communicated, in the engagements that I've had with members on the Hill, I think they understand this. Um, um, and there are a number of uh, really key members over there that do understand the importance to us. Um, but there's just, has, as you know, there are so many other elements that go into the debate um, and when it comes to the Department of Defense budget and the budget at, law, at large, but I do not believe that it's for a lack of understanding it. It's just a matter of how does that, those implications weigh against some of the other things that um, are important to our legislative branch as they go forward with this decision. Thank you. What are you doing to harness the capability of our reserve component to accomplish the command's mission? You know, we have, um, we have a pretty active um, reserve and guard participation um, at Air Force Materiel Command, more than I actually had realized before I took over as commander. Um, and they, they play a critical element across the board. One of the big areas that they play in the command is in our individual mobilization augmentees. And every single one of the centers has IMAs, um, as we call them, brief short for, for individual mobilization augmentees, that support us in every single one of um, our centers. In addition to that, um, we have some full-time folks. For example, we recently added three colonel positions to the Life Cycle Management Center to support the the National Guard and Reserve investments that are going on. So we have three full, they will be three full-time reservists managing programs at the Life Cycle Management Center. I recently, when I made my tour of the Air Force Sustainment Center air logistics complexes, took with me uh, Brigadier General Gary Keefe, who is my National Guard augmentee. And he, uh, and we have at each one of our Air Force Sustainment Centers guard representation, once again, because we don't, um, the guard does not have separate ALCs. Their, their aircraft come into our air logistics complexes the same as, um, as the active duty ones. So if you go down to, to um, Atlanta, you go down to Robbins, you will see F-15s there that, that come from the guard and the reserve and from the Air Force. So we have, a, we have them integrated across. We do have a couple of associate units as well. And in fact, General Keefe and I have talked about strengthening the relationship between their test comp center, they have a small test center, and the Air Force test center to see if we can better leverage them in that capacity as well. So they're a very integral part of what we do. And I, my personal experience, by the way, over the years has found that the reservists are very invaluable in the material management in this IMA function because they can bring and share what they're learning in industry. And so we get an opportunity to get a bird's eye view and somebody who is an expert when we talk about, well, why can't we do this the way industry does it? Well, talk to, to Jim because that's what he does in his day job and he's here for his reserve duty. And so um, they, 
they work very, very well at helping us to stay in touch with what's going on in that revolution that's out there in the rest of the aerospace industry. Thank you. Uh, yesterday, uh, the Secretary of the Air Force introduced this idea of should schedule. Could you uh, elaborate just a little bit on that concept? Yeah, I think what she, what she and um, Dr. O'Plan have been working on is this concept that when we start a program in all the Department of Defense services, we do an independent cost estimate. And as part of that independent cost estimate, they also lay out what you might call an independent schedule. And the independent cost estimate in this independent schedule is based on history. And, and since, particularly in that era when we had all those Nunn McCurdy's and the Department of Defense was getting criticized for failing to meet our commitments for cost and schedule, the whole view of this independent estimate was that you wanted somebody who, who could take a step back and look at this program without having any investment on their own. So what we have done across the Department of Defense is that when we lay in a program in the budget, we lay it in for the schedule and the cost that was done by this independent cost estimator. But starting with Secretary um, Carter when he was the Undersecretary for Acquisition and Technology, uh, the acquisition community has challenged our program managers and our program teams to try to drive below that, that, that cost estimate, that independent cost estimate. And that's what you've heard the term called should cost, where that was so, uh, for example, you know, Duke and Duke got money for engineering change proposals that was laid in in the service cost position in the independent estimate because history says we put in um, engineering change proposals even when we have a fixed price contract. Duke was very disciplined along with AMC and as part of their should cost, they didn't do any engineering change proposals, right Duke? So that should cost savings. So the should cost was what the program manager thinks it really should cost them versus what the independent cost estimator said. And we've been very, very successful over the last three to five years at driving down those costs. Um, and because the, and, and in reality, now the cost estimators are updating their cost estimating relationships. So it's getting tighter and tighter, you know, in terms of should cost savings. But one of the things that, that recently we looked at is they said, well, we've done this with the cost, but we haven't done this with the schedule. And so, and there are a couple of cases where we've thought that there were some pretty innovative ways to maybe drive the schedule down. For example, Joint Stars Recap. Um, when we looked at that, hey, if we were to use uh, an existing airframe and apply open mission systems um, and use um, essentially off the shelf, and I always use that term loosely, radars, maybe we don't need a six, seven year EMD program. Maybe we can pull that in. Well, guess what happens though? As we're setting up that program, the independent cost estimators come in, they look at what we did in the past, and lay, lay out a schedule that's a more traditional program. So what Dr. LaPlan and the Secretary are talking about is, just as we did the should cost, we're gonna challenge our program and industry teams to say, what's the should schedule? You know, what are we, con what are we gonna do that's innovative um, that will allow us to drive down to a, a schedule that's less than that independent schedule was, just as we've done it with the cost? And again, I, with the, uh, the, one of the things that we had to be careful about when we talked about should cost, and we need to be careful about when we talk about should schedule is, it has to be really based on data that says we can actually deliver the schedule. We're not looking for industry bids that says, well, we're just gonna take a six month challenge, right? And trust us, we can do this for six months shorter or a year shorter. Because we've been down that path before where we signed up for a schedule that was too tight and wasn't realistically based. So we're gonna do what should schedule what we did which should cost. We're gonna, no kidding, look at it, I think largely collaboratively, although the secretary talked about the incentive being, and we're gonna integrate it into the RFP, but it's gonna be a realistic look 
at really can we pull the schedules in. So that's what a should schedule is, very analogous to the should cost. And, uh, and I, my objective in this, by the way, is that out of this we could then, our independent estimates will get better and better. And then the real benefit of this is that we don't have money in the budget that doesn't need to be there for one program and we can apply it to another program. Because when we have an independent cost estimate with an independent schedule estimate that's too long and has more money in there, those resources are not available to apply somewhere else because we're driven to fund to the independent estimate. So it's a, all part of the initiative at really honing our acquisition skills to be able to predict the schedule and lay in just the right amount of resources so that we cannot waste dollars by ha having them sitting um, where they don't really need to be. Okay? Thank you. Ma'am, what are your top three R&D priorities? My top three research and development priorities, well, I'm looking at, you know, General Masiola here, and I think, for me, those game changers in technology, one of which I talked about, autonomy, you know, directed energy and hypersonics, uh, um, because I believe that all three of those can get us to that strategic agility. So those three are critically important. You think about it, it's speed. It's uh, the ability to reduce the manpower tail. Um, and uh, lasers are just awesome. <laughs> um, now, and then, of course, R&D investment for me, my other, so that's the, 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 I have to add a fourth one in, and that is I am going to be a demanding customer as the Agile Combat Support uh, core function leader to the laboratory and elsewhere to bring R&D to improving the way Air Force Materiel Command does its job, just like you saw there. I mean, I want to really understand uh, 3D printing, additive manufacturing, because I think it can be a game changer for sustainment. So if you were to ask me what's the fourth game changer, for me, in my mind, it's additive manufacturing, because it can truly change the calculus of how we sustain our systems. Thank you. Well, that ends our time, ma'am. Uh, we thank you so much for your presentation, for your time today. Uh, please accept this small gift as a token of our appreciation. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks, guys. Welcome back to Air Force TV's live coverage of the Air and Space Conference here at the National Harbor in Maryland. I'm Tech Sergeant Holly Roberts Davis, and we just heard from Air Force Materiel Command Commander General Ellen Polakowski and her take on harnessing the aerospace revolution. Um, you know, she opened up saying basically that she is not going to consider herself a harnesser, but definitely more of a revolutionary. Um, she doesn't want to lasso the rev the revolution. She actually wants to just embrace it and and be a revolutionary. Um, how Her main focus was how we deliver more agile weapon systems and remain more agile overall. And one way that she mentioned we can do that is by delivering smaller munitions um, under the control of a human. So getting the human aspect back in there instead of just having these large um, munitions um, that are controlled by a computer, definitely bringing it down back to the airman level. Um, she also gave an example of the B-2 bomber and how it's you know awesome in helping bring the capability, uh, um, you know, and, and it's, it's, it's a really awesome aircraft, but what she wants to do, it's kind of a neat idea, is instead of developing capabilities for each individual aircraft, what she wants to do is develop a plug-and-play system that we can develop this capability that we want all the aircraft to have, and then instead of developing different systems for each one, it can be plug and played essentially and work on all of the different aircraft um, and I think that's going to save some money and definitely some s development time across the board and of course uh, she mentioned that lasers are awesome so that's what I got out of it. Um, if you want to join in on the conversation let us know what you think about General Polakowski's discussion by using our hashtag ASC15 in your Facebook and Twitter comments. 
Stick around, we're going to be taking a little bit longer of a break and we're going to be back at 1.10 Eastern Time for Chief of Staff of the Air Force's Air Force update. I know you definitely do not want to miss that, um, so be sure to stick around for that. Everybody's going to go get some lunch and then we'll come back for that. If you stick around though at 3.35 p.m., we'll be here still to sit on another panel about meeting global requirements in a time of austerity with General Frank Gorence, General Lori Robinson, and the Deputy Undersecretary of the Air Force, Heidi Grant. And remember, if you missed any of the briefings today, don't worry. Everything will be available on Air Force Bluetube shortly after the end of the conference. For Air Force TV, I'm Tech Sergeant Holly Roberts-Davis. Thanks for watching.